Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another Tuesday night edition of To The Point Podcast. Hope you're all doing well, surviving the day and a half storm here in Rexton. Don't know how it is in St. John, but of course, joining me tonight is my co-host and the man who's d- directed us to watch Sharp Objects. We're going to be re- recapping episodes one and two tonight. Um, really interesting uh, show. I, I, we'll get into it, obviously, but Shay, how's the storm and how you doing so far this week? Good. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely been a gloom couple of days for sure with this storm. We got an MP. I think we get a little less snow than we did in Rexton, but it's uh, it's been good. And yeah, just working away and keeping busy kind of kind of makes the day go by fast. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I don't know if you saw it today, but uh, Sidney Crosby was placed on the uh, the COVID list for the NHL. So I did. I did. What do you think about that? Well, it's my first thought was he's the first quote unquote golden boy to be put on the COVID list. Like of every sport, you know, you didn't see Brady, you haven't seen LeBron, you know, uh, Justin Johnson, uh, you know, yeah. Joke. I guess Djokovic had it, but he's kind of an idiot, so I don't. I'm not surprised that he got it. Um, but um, yeah, it, it it came out of left field for sure. The game's still scheduled for tonight, so it's it's a bit weird. Yeah, well, and especially for Pittsburgh, where you know some of these other teams they might not need those players, but mm. the Pittsburgh Penguins right now they're they're trying to push for that last playoff spot. They need Sidney Crosby, so. I mean, I'm sure it's and it's, it's either way. Like you're, uh, who knows what he did or how he did, but I just know how you felt about the the capital situation. And you know, maybe if it was a similar one, uh, I mean, and the league doesn't respond, it kind of says a lot about uh, the old old Gary Bettman and how he feels about uh, Sid the Gold. Gold. Yeah, boy. it's it's uh, interesting for sure. I mean, we've seen so many COVID cases in the last three weeks and we haven't heard anything of how they started or any supplemental discipline. So yeah, it's a two way street everywhere in life, but uh, I'm sure that they won't make an exception for the golden boy. Um, But talking about getting into sharp objects, the first thing that really pointed out to me, Shay, what I liked about it, that's different than other shows. um, You see series is a lot of them don't have episode names. Um, This I like that they, you know, episode one's titled Vanish. I, uh, I like that. I think it's, it's kind of like a storybook. You know, it kind of ties in the book, kind of makes, makes it seem like a chapter. Obviously, this is based on a book by Gillian Flynn. So I, I kind of like that. No, I enjoy it too. Yeah. Uh, and I know what you mean. Like it's, uh, it just kind of gives more episode, more purpose. And you're, I know, obviously it kind of labels it for what it is. And you're always looking or sorry, you're always watching the episode looking for, you know, that deeper meaning behind why, why it's named that. So no, it was good. And it was, uh, it's like you say, it's a compelling show. And uh, Amy Adams does an amazing job Mm -hmm. these first couple episodes. And we'll get right into that. Uh, I guess you can probably start us, start us off, I guess, if you want. Yeah. um, So the episode starts where we're kind of, we're going through this place called wing gap and we learned that it's in Missouri it's kind of a small town. It gave me a little bit of a Ruxton vibe. Uh, it's kind of got that. Um, if you think of movies like a Texas kind of square where you have everything, you kind of have the church, you have the, the gun shop, the, uh, the grocery store, you know, it, it kind bar, of goes yeah. through, right. The bar kind of reminded me of Rexton in that sense. Also just watching films when it comes to Texas, you see that a lot. Um, and but it then pivots to these two 10 year old girls riding bikes. And it seems as if that they're breaking into somebody's property, they're trespassing. Um, and these two girls sneak into this beautiful home. Uh, it seems, seems like it's from like a 1900s home. I don't know if you got that. It kind of gave me a, a Matilda yeah. vibe, uh, you know, in, in the Trunchbull's house. Um, it's, it's kind of older, you can tell, but it's still very, obviously a, a beautiful property. And these two girls sneak upstairs and they go into a bedroom and they see a woman sleeping um, on her bed and, it, and it's Amy Adams. And, you know, the redhead takes a paper clip and stabs her, you know, pinches her in the, in the finger and Amy Adams awakes. And it, it didn't dawn on me right away, but it, it, I'm, I'm sure it did for you. I was just a little out of it that, you know, that was Amy Adams as a younger, as a younger girl. Yeah. Yeah. You probably, uh, you, you maybe get that vibe. They obviously look very similar. She's, she's yeah. got shorter hair, obviously, which Amy Adams is not, but 
uh, even the facial features is really good, which is, you know, fantastic Agreed. job by the casting crew to, mm -hmm. uh, to get somebody that looks that identical to her. Um, and it's, yeah, that's a cool scene because she gives her that pinch and then Amy Adams awakes and only to find out that she's in her apartment building, you know, right. in, in a city. I think it's either Kansas City or St. Louis. I kind of forget. St. Louis, um, yeah. It is St. Louis. So, yeah. So, she, you know, she awakes there. And, you know, right away you can tell, you know, maybe there's something wrong or something's not right with her just because, um, you know, it's the middle of the day, you know, and she's all her curtains are shut. All her lights are off. Um, she's awoken by a phone. And this, this kind of was weird for me, Juggy. She has two phones. Did you, did you pick up on anything about that? Was there a reason for that? Yeah. Um, for me, the reason is um, that she's a journalist. So as a journalist or somebody in that field, you have a work phone and then a personal because say you write a story or something and it's um, controversial. People can access you online, say via via um, the uh, website or something like that, they can track you, right? So having a personal probably is best in case she's hacked too. Um, you know, she doesn't want her personal affairs being dealt with. So I kind of, just from my journalism background, I know a lot of journalists do have a, you know, work and personal phone at the ready. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So but she yeah. she answered, oh, go ahead. No, yeah, no, she, she answers, uh, the work one, I believe, um, correct, because she, yeah, she, uh, she had her other one, and then she looks at her work one, but yeah, it's at this point we learn that she's a journalist. She works for the St. Louis Chronicle. She doesn't seem like she's got a great footing, like you said. She's sleeping during the middle of the day. Uh, she's seems kind of hungover, um, and you know, her, she goes to see her boss, and her boss was an interesting character to me. Um, he's He's a sympathetic figure to, and our, I'm sorry, but our main killer, main character's name is Camille Preaker. Um, he's he's sympathetic to her, but he also is a is a great motivator because I think he really wants her to succeed, and he tells her that she's going to Win Gap, her her hometown, and you know a young teen was strangled um, a few in August a few months back. And now a second young girl has been abducted and he wants her to go there to cover the story. And um, it's clearly uncomfortable for her in, in the moment. Yeah. She's immediately reluctant to go. Um, uh, she's like, you know, why, why can't someone else cover it? Or, and immediately he's like, you know, this, this is your, this is your town. This is where you're from. Um, you have the background on it and we want you there. And she kind of automatically goes, well, this city, you know, this city gets, you know, abductions and, you know, serial killers all the time. Like what's, what's, what's so special about wind gap. And, you know, he automatically referenced uh, another uh, very small town serial killer vibe story that someone that another journalist wrote. And he said, well, this blew up, you know, immensely. This is so this is the, you know, this for you could be a huge break for you in your career, which kind of gives us the sense that maybe she's not as successful or she, maybe she she still needs a lot to work on. She's not maybe the up, up to par journalist. Um, but yeah, they definitely have an interesting relationship because uh, they seem, you know, it's not, it's not very father, father, like figure to her yet, but I just, a, just a mentor to her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could, it's like you said earlier, he's really pushing her to, uh, you know, to go out there and to, to do her best. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's an interesting scene, but I, uh, I just like his character in general, and uh, we'll probably talk about it later, but he's more involved than I even thought he would be. I kind of thought that was going to be the extent of his character, that they have that little meeting, you know, he sends her off and that's it. Mm -hmm. But um, throughout the show, we see Camille, you know, constantly calling him, uh, kind of getting advice on where to go and how to do, you know, do things. So he's obviously, he's an editor, but he's a very experienced journalist in his own right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I, I thought he would be done. You know, it was quick. You see that all the time where yeah. it's even in a, a police show the the captain sends them off. You never see that character again. He had his two lines. He gets his paycheck. He's gone. You know, this guy, he stays in the show and he's in it multiple times an episode. Um, and, you know, as soon as she gets the job, we start seeing flashbacks. And this is 
a huge part of the show. And if, if anybody's seen the movie Gone Girl, uh, Gillian Flynn wrote Gone Girl. She wrote this. It's, it's similar because we see that a lot in Gone Girl where when she's seeing Neil Patrick Harris, we kind of see the background of their relationship. Well, in multiple scenes, we see her in the woods being chased by younger men. Um, we see her with a younger, a younger woman, another younger teen that we, we don't really know who it is at, at the time. We'll get into that. But none of the memories are, are particularly good. You know, she goes into a shed and she sees, I, I think it's a picture of, of a woman being raped uh, or a younger girl being raped. It, she has nothing but negative feelings about going back to Wing Gap. It, nothing is positive about it. Yeah, which is, I mean, that obviously breaks up her, you know, why she didn't want to go in the first place. And that's an interesting, uh, interesting scene because I, if, if we, for, uh, we miss this talking about their conversation with the editor, but uh, they go, you know, what, you know, what, what kind of town is Wind Gap? Like he doesn't know much about it, obviously. And she goes, well, it's basically, you know, rich and then trash. And, mm-hmm. and he goes, okay, which are you? And he's basically, well, I'm, I'm rich. I'm, I think she says I'm, I'm rich, rich from trash. the trash. Yeah, I'm rich trash a bit of exactly. Um, you know, and the in the she kind of has this flashback where she's in a pond, she's just kind of swimming, and you know, she hears gunshots, these boys run by, they're hunting. And this, this is a really, really great scene where the boy, one boy stops, sees her in the pond, and then just points a rifle at her. And I'm like, holy shit, like it, it's it's really messed up, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I thought it was just kind of an interesting scene, and then he just kind of chuckles and keeps on running but yeah and then she, it's like you said she kind of has this scene where she goes into this shed which i can only presume is their camp per se or what mm-hmm. or whatnot and then uh it's just basically new girls and like you said like some pretty graphic stuff going on in there yeah and we also kind of learn through her speaking that she she doesn't have a great relationship with her mother um she left wing gap kind of uh, abruptly to say the least. And her and her mother are not in contact very often. They don't really see eye to eye. And we go back to her apartment. She's getting ready to leave. And her bag is basically consisted of a few shirts and a bunch of cigarettes, candy, and a lot of uh, little shooters of vodka. So yeah, little minis, little mini vodkas, but it kind of gives you the impression that we're dealing with, I, I'd say an alcoholic here. Yeah. 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 It's pretty, it's as, as the show goes into it and she's a clear sign of an alcoholic is someone who needs booze just to, you know, get through the day. And as she's driving to wind gap, well, she's boozing the entire way mm-hmm. or she's got this move where she just basically fills a mini uh, and then she, she just, or sorry, she fills a water bottle with a mini and water. And that's like, that's just kind of her drink. She does that throughout these first two episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you can just see her blast, basically blasting tunes, smoking darts and just driving down the highway, just basically going to wind gap. Yeah. Another big scene, or it wasn't a big scene, but it was just interesting how many smokes she had. They really wanted us to know. You see how the camera zoomed in? She must have had eight to 10 smokes because that thing, yeah. that thing was full. And <laughs> she gets she gets to Wind Gap and she checks into this greasy motel that's not clean, just disgusting. But she's there. And um, we learn that the second woman taken is named Natalie Keene. Again, she's another y- younger woman. Um, and we also learned through just conversation and uh, Camille doing her own digging that talking to uh, the police chief that the first victim was strangled with clothesline wire. Uh, that's pretty graphic. Uh, they found her at a pond and uh, I, it, it was alarming to me, you know, clearly this author and the show is not afraid to, to kind of push the boundaries when it comes to younger people dying. You know, we don't see that a lot in shows and two, two women, two younger women are dead in the first two, first two episodes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great point to, to push those limits. Um, it's a dark show by, by no means. Um, you, and you kind of get that feeling right away. Um, and, but yeah, so 
so Natalie Kane, obviously, I think is 10 and maybe the girl abducted before was maybe nine. Yeah. So very young. Um, and, you know, we find out more about them, I think, as the series goes along. But, uh, yeah, certainly, certainly no uh, boundaries when it comes to the, the aspect of children dying, for sure. Yeah. Um, so she talks to the police chief. The, we'll kind of go over. The police chief doesn't give her anything. He's kind of no comment, doesn't want her in the town. He's treats her pretty poorly. Um, so she leaves. And it's at this point, she goes to see her parents and it brings us back to this beautiful home that we saw in the opening scene. And so her father, it's her stepfather, I believe, because her father either left or he passed away. Um, but her, her stepfather is a, a wealthy guy. Um, he's kind of a, kind of a weird dude. Uh, but he, he's, he's nice to her somewhat. He's kind of the voice of reason. Um, and her mother, I describe her mother as a piece of work. Um, she's, she's another one that I think is a closet alcoholic. Uh, clearly these two are kind of older people. They're wealthy. They like to have a drink probably with a meal. Uh, and then every meal, <laughs> a, a couple throughout the day, they uh, just some for, for reference, they have a, they have a black woman who is a maid. Um, yeah. you, know, you get those, you get those Southern vibes, right? Right away. That, yeah. The way the house looks, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, the property. And when you, once yeah. you see the black maid, you're like, okay, you can kind of, you're kind of putting it together. Like these people are, you know, which side of the civil war they would have been. On. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. And you know, Camille actually get, you know, the, the maid gives Camille a big hug and she clearly, yeah. they clearly had a good relationship. She's clearly worked for the family for a long time. Um, but it's, yeah, I agree. It's, it's not slavery, but it's also not uh, free and fair. I'd say with, with these people. Um, yeah, exactly. So her mother, her mother, who's played by Patricia, Patricia Clarkson, she's another fantastic actress. I, I think she, she kills it in these first two episodes. Um, she's a wreck. Uh, she's really mean to Camille. Uh, she's condescending. And at the same time, she's so focused on the reputation of Camille because it affects her more than actually caring about her daughter's, you know, well-being when it comes to alcoholism or, you know, her life in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's worth noting that she was kind of, she was really taken back by the fact that, you know, Camille just kind of showed up out of nowhere. I think her name is Adora. So yeah, Ador- mm-hmm. Adora. And then their, their new maiden name, they don't have the same main names. Uh, Amy Adams character is Gren- Grenlin, I think. Grenlin. Yeah. So Adora Grenlin's her name. And she, yeah, she's like, you know, I really wish she would have called like, and, and she even asked her, she's like, where are you staying? You know, just not, not, not even assuming that she was going to stay with them. So you can clearly tell that they don't, they don't have the best relationship. Um, and yeah, she's, it's like you said, she's very direct. Uh, she's very small, small town minded in the sense that she, you know, her kids at the end of the day kind of represent what, what, you know, they represent her because they're her offspring, yeah. obviously. Yes. And so they have a small talk. Um, her mother's bringing her up to her room because he wants her to stay, obviously. And Camille gets to her room and it's, it's clearly something that affects her because right away after being in there 30 seconds, uh, she gets a flashback and it's a flashback of her and a younger, a younger girl. And, and this young girl starts choking. Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Chip, I think they've been smoking weed or something to, to that effect. I think they've been doing some kind of drug. Um, yeah, and maybe. So, some, they were doing something with a narcotic. I don't know if it was weed or if it was, you know, something stronger than that, but they were doing something behind their parents back because their parents are are very strict. Um, and this younger girl starts to choke and it kind of fades away, but we we do learn that throughout the show that this was her younger sister, um, who who, who was choking Miriam. Yes. Who, who who was the, the better sibling in, in her parents' eyes. She was, you know, yeah. Uh, Amy Adams or Camille Preaker was the you know quote unquote redheaded stepchild, if you will. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's like you said, they, we, we recently realized, I think it really comes out the second episode more than this episode. She's kind of kept a mystery, mm-hmm. uh, same with that room. But yeah, it's, it's her, it's her uh, deceased sister, uh, Marilyn, who uh, I think in that, ep- I think that flashback kind of had to do with something about her sickness, Chuggy, where she was having a seizure maybe, or mm-hmm. uh, maybe, maybe they were smoking something that would have triggered that as well. Right. She, that could have been it. Yeah. And uh and you know i think it's kind of the sign to come that we know what really happened in marion but yeah no uh, immediately once this happens she gets this flashback um she kind of leaves the home she sneaks out just kind of like how she snuck in when she um at at the the very opening scene Mm -hmm. uh, and she goes to a bar um and you know right away we can tell by uh the people who she sees the aka the bartender um, she's very well known there, which, you know, it's a good sign. She, she was probably, she's probably a partier in her, in her yeah. younger days, but, but, uh, no, she's kind of, uh, she's kind of welcomed with open arms per se when she gets there. Yeah, very much. So the bartender knows her by name, you know, he, I think he kind of flirts with her a little bit. Um, and at the bar is a, a detective. He's from out of town. He's from Kansas city and he's here researching the case he's been here for a long time trying to find out what what uh what happened and you know they're both very aloof with each other uh clearly you got a detective and a journalist those two don't mesh well together anytime <laughs> uh, but you know they're they kind of have this funny little banter uh where i think they both know that they're doing a job but um he's not willing to give her any information yet uh on the record or off the record for that matter yeah and you know Camille just decides to, um, to take it deep. Uh, and she drinks about a bottle of whiskey and she, uh, actually falls asleep in the, in the, in the driver's seat of her car, uh, in the outside of the bar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think it shows, I think that your that conversation you talked about between her and, uh, um, and the detective who's actually, he's a pretty decent actor. I'll get into him maybe later, but, uh, their conversation is funny because she's just kind of pickering like a journalist would uh, mm-hmm. and trying to get everything he can. And he's like, well, what, you know, can we have like, calm, can we have small talk first? Like, what do you do? Where are you from? And she just immediately shuts that down. And I think that just showed a lot about her personality as a, um, a as an actor and as a character in the show, because, you know, she's, she's just not like that. She's not one to just sit down and have a drink and have small talk and conversation. Like she, she's kind of there for, for a reason. And in her mind, she's there, can be there a few days and she's gone, um, which I'm sure doesn't actually happen. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. She's, then, yeah. Go on. Oh, I was going to say, she, then she just takes it. So what happens is she takes it to the car. She, I think she just starts playing a song. She's got the head going. Yeah. And next thing you know, she, she wakes up and I think it's morning time. She goes to start her car while her car is dead because she fell asleep with the music blaring, obviously. Yeah. So, so then she says she must get somebody to come, come help her out. And it's a, it's a funny scene because she gets out, she walks up to the first house she sees there's someone's classic, someone spraying their lawn yeah, yeah. And, and she waves, but the person doesn't wave back. She, yeah. the person's kind of like, eh. it's probably it's like Saturday morning. Like the, just, just get the fuck away from me. So yeah. you get, you get the feeling from this small town that it's, it's maybe not uh, everyone so joyful and, uh cheerful and there mm-hmm. for each other like in the clearly the town is going through something with uh with these murders and these kidnappings yeah very much so like it's mentioned throughout that kids aren't going to parks um it's you know people are scared uh for sure um so it's at this point camille goes to the first victim Anne's family's home um and you know this is kind of this is kind of a big scene. Uh, we learn he, she talks to the Nash family. He the father is is there. The mother's kind of out of the picture at the moment. Um, so she's she talks to the father. He tells her she was riding her bike to her friend Emily's at about seven a.m., um, which is about ten blocks, and she never made it. Uh, it she was she never made it. They never found her uh, until until she was ultimately killed. It's also pointed out that she was raped. Um, And, you know, this, the Nash family has four kids and 
the father is not the most gentle person. Uh, one of his daughters comes in the room and he scolds her for not knocking. And then he's very abrasive. Um, and he definitely seems like he has a, he has a bad temper and he kind of gave me the feeling too, that he's not afraid to beat his kids if he had to. No. And, uh, and she, she has a, she, right after this, she has a conversation with uh, the editor and, you know, she brings this up uh, and almost kind of accusing him as being a suspect. Like this guy is not, probably would not be afraid to maybe do something to his kids. Now this is obviously a tad bit extreme to do to your own, to your own kid, but, you know, it's, he's clearly a weird guy. You can tell that right away. Um, and yeah, you're right. Just that short little conversation he had with his daughter, you can tell that he probably doesn't have a great relationship. What's interesting to me, Juggy, is that, you know, uh, Camille asks, okay, so where's your wife? And mm -hmm. the wife's gone. So what, what did you think of that? And like, why, you know, what, what was going on there? Yeah, that was strange. Um, my first thought was maybe she, she left him. Um, but yeah. You know, leaving her kids behind is a that's not a great mother. I mean, if you know, if she's getting abused, if she's gone, who's going to take it? Her children. Uh, so I kind of thought maybe she left him, but it, it's a bit, it's a big thing to watch because we'll talk about him again in the second episode where he makes a couple different appearances, but he's, he doesn't give you a good sense. He doesn't give you something like, okay, I believe this guy is innocent because he's got some skeletons in his closet, I think for sure. Yeah, I agree. So that she talks to him, like you said, she talks to the editor. He's like, did you get, you know, the journalism stuff? Did you get the action? Did you find detail in the home? You know, I've heard that from, from teachers my whole life when it comes to getting good details. That was kind of a flashback for me. <laughs> But uh, the year. yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> so it's at this point, she goes to city hall um, to look at, at kind of Natalie's flowers and people kind of um, wishing her luck. You see that in movies where they'll light, light a candle or bring flowers, bring donations, kind of a prayer circle, if you will, kind of just a donation. And she's, so she's there. She's, She's there. She's there. She's a bunch of younger, younger people uh, skateboarding. We've seen these people before when she goes with the search party to kind of to uh, look for for Natalie and kind of catch a scene there earlier. But it's at this point that we hear a scream from from across the road. This older woman is on her knees crying, and Natalie Keene's body is found hanging outside of the the window across the street. Um, and she's, yeah. she's not in great shape whatsoever. She looks pretty badly beaten before, before her death. Yeah. And uh, this, you know, this goes to back to what, what we said earlier about this being a very dark show. It's very hard maybe for some people to see that in general. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even hard for them probably to show it. I'm sure without getting flack back, I'm sure cancel culture these days would have probably, you know, been right up this alley. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's her dead body. You could tell, that it's probably been diseased for a while. Just how I agree. It. Yeah. Um, but it almost looks like it was prompted up to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and this comes up to later. It's very different than the first killing because the first right. killing. He you know, was he, hidden. The killer dumped the body exactly somewhere where maybe he thought wasn't going to be found. This one was right in the middle of this, the town. So, you know, no doubt it was going to get found sooner or later. So uh, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting. And, but, and, um also would forgot to mention that one of these teens that was hanging outside um and nashes who's the first uh the first kidnapped and the first killed uh younger younger woman uh was john Keane, and mm -hmm. that's natalie Keane's older brother and you know for him obviously he's going to be going through something seeing his younger younger sibling like that right yeah you know, you're right um he's We'll get into him because he's another kind of a weird guy. Uh, but yeah, he was there. We don't really see his reaction, which I found interesting. Um, I found I found this scene interesting for a number of reasons. We, we didn't see him and him kind of crying, which we wouldn't in normal shows. And also I, I found when they found the body, it wasn't really a dramatic scene. You know, um, obviously the woman was crying, but the way the show depicted it, it was, it wasn't like, you know, you think of, of, of 
of another show, it would be, you know, everybody's just freaking out and mm. you don't know how to Maybe. react. I, I didn't take it that way. I thought it was, it was pretty quick. It was a cut to cut out kind of thing. And it, mm-hmm. I, I didn't have it the same feeling as even, you know, movies. Yeah, it was probably less than a minute long, to be honest. And maybe that's what the director and the writers were trying to do, was just trying to normalize this, you know, this darker moment where they find a dead body. Right. Um, but who knows? It's it's hard to say. Yeah. So she's there. She has to go to the police station to give a statement. The detective is kind of talking to her. Um, she's shook. She's shook. Uh, Camille's very shook. She's shaking. Uh, she's having a drink, which is no surprise yeah. um, I, find it, I find it hilarious that that's like that was so the detective brings her basically a bottle of whiskey and i think he's in, in a way he's kind of he's helping her he feels bad for her and you know she kind of goes right into journalist mode and she starts basically trying to get stuff out of him even yeah. though she's clearly shook she's i think she's just ptsd herself but she's at the same time trying to get details about this case because she wants to know more and she knows the detective probably has more to offer. Right. No, good point. Uh, she, uh, she flips back into, into her job. Uh, it's probably easier than to think about what she just saw. So again, for different people finding a different outlet. Um, and as the first episode ends, she goes back to her parents' home and we learn that, you know, she has a, a half sister uh, and, you know, this sister had been rollerblading uh, in the city hall. Um, and she, she was, uh, we didn't really get to see her. She wasn't really, we didn't see her as shook in the scene, but it was a surprise to me because we've we seen her twice in the episode. She was talking for the group of skateboarders and we learned that her name is Emma and she's her half sister, but she's, she's an interesting character. And, um, I think she, She's going to play a role definitely as the show keeps going, but it was interesting to see her k- k- come into the show here. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of known that there's someone else in the house when she, when uh, Camille get first gets there. But um, I think the mother kind of shoes it away like, Oh, she's sleeping or, Oh, would, there's a curfew for nine. There's, I think throughout the town, there's a curfew of nine o'clock for all kids yeah. just with this going on. Um, but yeah, so I, I thought that was super interesting. And, you know, right away Camille calls her out and she's, like why didn't you say anything and emma says well you know i had i didn't know it was you at first i had to be sure and then they kind of have this this little weird conversation and it's uh they're gonna have an interesting relationship throughout the show i think because obviously emma's the goal it's like any younger children there's Mm -hmm. a golden child uh, um you know they're obviously favorited i i mean obviously maybe even through past the past with camille and her mother like their maybe their relationships torn anyways but mm-hmm. the fact that you know the mother only has emma now in the home uh definitely makes her the favorite and you know i think emma knows that in a sense yeah emma's clearly the sheltered child um they want her to be the prodigy to be the the chosen one so to speak um right and when we learn that um you know, camille's younger sister you mentioned earlier passed um, when she was younger, she was kind of seen as the perfect one. And you had Camille who was kind of maybe leading her down the wrong path. You know, Emma is, I think they're, they're a little apprehensive to let Emma be near Camille because of, you know, a little PTSD or a little worry that she'll go down the path that, uh, you know, Marilyn had when she, when she died. Yeah, I no, I agree. So that kind of takes us to the end of episode one. Uh, another interesting point. I, I just thought the episode ended. It was no real cliffhanger. I found that was a bit, a little, I, I like that a little better. Um, it's, you see that every show is kind of a cliffhanger ending to an episode. Yeah, uh, so it's sometimes trendy. they work, but I think every episode, it gets a little redundant. It's trendy. Um, eh? especially, yeah. Especially in an episode that's beginning off like this. Like, I think it just makes a statement for, for the episode itself. Like, you know, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to get you to get, we're not going to give anything to come back, but if you liked it, yeah, keep watching. Right. They're confident in what they're creating. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think of Ozark, they don't really, they do that. You know, I think episodes end. I mean, obviously the end, if you've watched Ozark, I'm not going to spoil it, but the last episode of season three, that was a bit of a cliffhanger <laughs> uh, to say to speak. So uh, to say the least, but 
uh, it, before that, every episode just kind of ends, you know, it, it, you, if you want to watch the show, watch it. If you don't, you know, you don't have to, I, I, I kind of appreciate that, uh, when it comes to the writing and directing of the show. Um, so this, you know, this episode starts, um, like I said earlier, and died near the Creek. So this is like you said, this is a different MO, uh, dumping the body in, in a body of water. You could be seen as, you know, that maybe that body will never be found. If you, you know, put her to the, to the ocean floor, she, uh, floats to the bottom. She's never seen from again, unless you get, you know, a search party. This one's yeah. in broad daylight. It's completely different MO where, the perpetrator wants his work to be seen, so to speak. He, he wants the media attention. He wants people to see what he's capable of. And that's a complete 180 from the first. And we don't know yet if, if it's the same guy or woman, but it's um, clearly we have a serial killer Two two kills. That's, that's, that's enough to be considered a serial killer. Right. And that's kind of what Camille's there for in a sense is to, is to get there and to, you know, to collect as much information uh, about this. Um, what's interesting, you know, all these conversations, these phone conversations, she starts having with the editor. Um, at the end of it, it's always kind of, it's, it's just left with the editor and his wife. Um, and, you know, the wife kind of is like, you know, you're, you're pushing her too hard, you mm-hmm. know, and he's always like, no, she needs this. Like she needs to get out of this funk. So in a way, he knows that she's she's stu- clearly suffering from some sort of mental illness, whether it's depression or, you know, something even worse. Right. But, you know, in, in, in his mind, he's kind of helping this, helping this by facing these demons, which I, I think is interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, he's putting her in a situation where she has to face them. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's something I think you can, we can correlate that to, to rehab Shay. Uh, we can't make anybody go, but you're only going to get better if, if you admit your faults or yeah. that's just one that comes to mind when it comes to addiction. Uh, you, you're only going to, what you're only going to get better when you admit you have a problem and mm-hmm. for her, her life maybe just be on, it might be a little bit in the mud or in the dirt, which is what this episode's called just to use that as an analogy where she's not getting any better because she's not facing her faults, her past transgressions and just accepting them and moving on. I think her, her, her family, we could see the same thing. Her mother still clearly blames her for her sister's death. And as Harvard ill will, since she was, you know, a young teen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, there's an interesting scene. I don't know. I think it's maybe later in this episode, but it just kind of, it just kind of shows the past and what their relationship was like. Uh, the, the both girls are running and um, the Marion, the, 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 the younger dead sister runs kind of right into um, right into Adora's arms, the mother's arms and Adora kind of embraces her mm-hmm. and kind of just ignores Camille, which I think is just perfect. It, it just says their relationship perfectly. And then she, I think she just takes her in, into a room and shuts the door on Camille. Like, yeah. okay, like, uh, yeah, it's nice to see you. Okay, but Camille, you can just leave. Right. We don't really care about you. Yeah, no, it is. It's the perfect. It's a perfect way to to look at it, and that was a really good way of just showing it and without having yeah. words. I think that's you know show don't tell. And that that was that was perfect in that sense. Um, the next Camille and her family go to the funeral. Um, it's important the mother says that they go and she wants everybody to be well behaved. Um, she doesn't let, she doesn't let Emma go, which was interesting. She doesn't want her there. She doesn't want her to relive the trauma. So she's going to stay home and eat ice cream, which is laughable, um, for, for a young teen, but she's just going to stay home, eat ice cream. So her, her husband, adore her husband and Camille go to the funeral. Yeah. Um, Camille starts to take notes, which is what a journalist does. And her mother steals her pen and steals another pen. And she's clearly so uncomfortable. Um, you know, and Camille does get a few things jotted down. She writes that John Keane, you know, her brother was her best friend to, to Natalie, which <laughs> it's strange to me. Um, 
I, I think we have siblings. Obviously, we, we both have siblings. We, we love our siblings. But, you know, if you had a gun to Tally's head, I'm not her best friend. Um, I, you know, she likes me a good deal, I'm sure, most days. But did you find that strange? I just found that a little strange to me. Yeah, I, I did pick up on it right away. Um, and she even writes down in her notebook, loser like question yeah. mark. Like, <laughs> yeah. maybe this guy was a loser like obviously like if right. he's just hanging out with his younger sibling um, right significantly okay. younger yeah so what does it really say about him but um as we find out they're not originally from Winbag. they're they're from somewhere else and that's all that we know through these two episodes but it might say something about how the town embraced them or how the town was embracing them um so it, it's it's interesting but yeah obviously he's a he's a strange dude he's He's a weird kid. And, you know, obviously through Camille's eyes, he's a suspect because, you know, we know there's what, who knows what kind of freaky stuff like that he was into. And maybe he, I don't know, outlashed at his sister for some reason. Right. Um, and it's, it's at this point that Camille's at the funeral, but she also, she gets a flashback and it's, she's reminded of her sister's funeral. And this was, this was an interesting scene for me. Uh, she goes to the casket and she starts basically pulling at her sister, trying to pulling at her mouth, pulling at her face, trying to wake her up. Yeah. And she basically has to be pulled off her, her dead sister um, by multiple people. And it causes a big scene, but uh, it clearly shows her grief. Um, and I don't know, we don't know the full story yet. I still think in this episode, we get bits and pieces of how she, obviously she was sick, like you said. Right they may have been using a narcotic, which may have progressed her dying sooner. Mm -hmm. But I think more than anything, her parents make her feel responsible for her death. And she was losing somebody that oddly enough was probably her best friend. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's clear that she doesn't have many. So it, uh, um, it, it was, it was, it was a, it was an interesting scene also, you know, obviously a, a tough one for Camille. She kind of, she had to leave, she had to leave the funeral because it, it got to her. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, it's interesting. <laughs> the mother, before they leave uh, for the funeral, she goes, don't embarrass me again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I really thought about that. I was like, okay, you know, clearly something happened in the past that, you know, and the mother obviously very cautious of her image and doesn't want, to you know doesn't want her daughters to misbehave in any so way so i was like oh maybe later in the series they'll show something that camille did that will do that but no it was it was late just later just a you know a mere 10 minutes later on the episode they showed that they showed the scene where camille is flaying arms she has to be thrown basically thrown out of the funeral home mm-hmm. uh, she's knocking stuff over so yeah so it's 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 there and uh, you can tell that you can tell that she's She's, she was very emotional, but uh, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a huge scene for her. So she takes off and <laughs> what's the first thing she do? She does she goes, goes, get some liquor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She goes, yeah. Like you said, she goes to get some booze um, and who she sees at the grocery store stealing Emma. booze <laughs> is Emma on her rollerblades. She's pouring it into a Sprite bottle um, and she, you know, she sees her, Emma notices it, but she's a confident young woman. She goes up to her and basically says, you got five bucks for a Sprite. And she's, she's not going to be the perfect child because she's got this cavalier attitude, more like Camille, I think probably wants, I think she, what Emma is what Camille wanted to be when she was younger. She wanted to kind of step out of her family's shadow. Again, she was the trash of the rich where she didn't want to go to the norm. She didn't want to do what her parents told her to do. They, she didn't want to be sheltered. And Emma is clearly breaking those rules. There's a 9 p.m. curfew. She's supposed to be eating ice cream. She doesn't care. She's not listening to her parents and uh, doing whatever she wants. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that uh, she, she's basically, she basically said in the last, and to shorten, they have this scene. It's kind of like where they first meet. And they, they finally, they get a second together in private with, away from their parents. And uh, Emma goes like, oh, like I, I know about you and I know like about your past kind of and what mm-hmm. you did. And she's like, I'm kind of like that too, but like just under the, our parents, under my parents' nose essentially. So 
the parents get one version of Emma and clearly now through what we can find out, like she was smoking cigarettes. Clearly she's drinking. Yeah. Obviously she's doing all this under her parents' nose and they have no idea. Right. And before she takes off, we do get one really interesting anecdote. It's kind of under, under the radar. They're talking about Natalie and about the funeral and just going on about it. And she says, well, you know, I don't know anything about the serial killer, Emma says, but one thing I do know is he hasn't been kidnapping popular girls. Mm. She kind of says it, Camille's worried about her well-being. And it kind of gives us the indication that, you know, Anna and Natalie weren't very popular, which maybe it means nothing, but um, it it's just, I found it an interesting little throwaway quote where, She's confident, but also maybe it's something we'll see down the line where if another girl is taken, if she's kind of off the beaten path or not a very popular person, maybe it's a pattern of the serial killer to, to target victims that are you know clearly easy targets because they don't have friends to look out for them or things of that nature. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, it's kind of interesting, like now Camille, Camille kind of has this information but like a detective or the police, they're not gonna they they're not gonna know this. They're not gonna go around just asking anybody, you know, who's popular, who's not popular. Right. They probably just don't dig deep enough into that. But now Camille knows that, so it's information she'll use uh, probably in in the future, which is kind of interesting. So we pivot, we basically pivot away from you know the store, and there now we're in the Keen's home. Uh, they're kind of having like a wake, yeah, um, like a wake service where a bunch of people show up. They bring food. Uh, very typical and you know Camille goes there uh, her mother's you know I think her mother her mother keeps saying that she's very invested into the community oh I'm so invested in the community mm -hmm. I knew these girls I, how much of that you believe is very yeah. you know it's it's because it, you kind of feel like that she's a very self-centered very selfish person right. and you know did she really know those girls or does she want to believe that she knew them to make right. herself feel better <laughs> right so you know, she's put, she kind of puts on a show that she's, you know, she's pout, pouting a little bit in the corner, whatnot. At one point, Camille walks across the room and, you know, she turns around and her mother's just blankly staring at her, which I thought I, I was like, okay, like her mother's probably pissed at her for, for whatever reason, maybe the writing notes in the, in the funeral or uh, sorry, at the church uh, and whatnot. But yeah, so we see that Camellia, a couple, couple of people come up to Camellia, this, this oncurring uh, character named Jackie who's, you know, friends with the mother a little bit. She's hometown. She mm -hmm. clearly likes, uh, she clearly likes Camille. Yeah. Uh, she's a little bit older, I think, but I think they, they have a good relationship. Um, and then some other girls come up and they don't really, really, they're not really invested in Camille, but they are more or less just talking about themselves and gossiping kind of like, but you're basically a small town group of group, group of people really just like, Oh, like, you know, you know, oh, Amy, you know, Amy's pregnant or, right. you know, oh, this person, well, he was, he was bad kid, but all Camille really cares about. Yes, exactly. Socialites. And that's, they're not really worried. They're, they don't give any feeling towards why they're no. there. They don't care about, you know, this dead girl. They're just there to socialize basically. Um, but it's just like we saw with uh, Amy Adams and the detective, she, she's kind of like, she, she doesn't care about that stuff. She's there for a reason. She's just basically asking them questions and getting ignored by these, these four, four or five women. Right. And yeah, she, Jackie kind of tells her, stay away from them. They're yeah. <laughs> idiots. Uh, they don't know anything. They're really insensitive to the, to the whole wake. And, you know, like you said, a young team being dead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at this point, Camille sneaks into Natalie's bedroom, kind of takes inventory of it. Um, she, kind of sees a spider in a jar, which is kind of interesting, kind of writes down some of the color of the room. So she, when she writes her story, she can kind of paint a picture of what it's like in the home, what it's like in her bedroom. Um, and we, we learn that she, she kind of talks to um, the father of Natalie and he, we learned that he was actually away on business when uh, she was abducted. So he's, kind of written off as a suspect but before before the reception bob nash anna's father who was obviously the suspect the first original suspect of camille was kicked out of the reception literally thrown out of the house 
And this, this was interesting because she, before she even went in, he was getting tossed. We don't know why we, they don't really go into it. Uh, but he, we know he's got a temper. He's probably a drinker and he, he, any, for any re, for whatever reason, he's thrown out of, of, of the home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think even at some point, I don't know who, I don't know if, if she was, um, Camille was talking to the, um, someone from the Nash family and it's like, Oh, you know, how are you doing with all this? Because I think for them, maybe, uh, it feels like none of the attention's on Anna anymore. It's all on, uh, Natalie, the, the right. second girl that goes missing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now, now that she's dead, well, she's, you know, she's kind of the, the spotlight of the town and it's no longer on the Nash family. So maybe I thought maybe that's why he got kicked out was because maybe he was trying to make it about them and right. about his daughter. Could it could have been, could have heard of all then. I yeah. mean, it, you can't really blame him in that, in that situation. I mean, no. his daughter is that, that murder is still unsolved. So uh, he, he would have a vested interest in that. Um, then we pivot to the detective going to get the autopsy um, uh, for, from Natalie's death. We learn that she had her teeth removed before she was murdered with pliers. Um, yeah, that that was a graphic to learn that because he, the doctor goes into it and he says, you have to be a physically very physically strong person to pull out teeth with, with just normal pliers, you know, household pliers, you'd find it in the kitchen cabinet. And right. It doesn't tell you that it's a, a man per se, but it kind of points you in that direction because it has to be, it has to at least be a strong fit person in my opinion for somebody to do that. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, the, the, the doctor even says, yeah, it, it's, it'd be a rush. And you know, and uh, the detective asked him why, and because well, it just it just be so physically demanding that you'd really have to, you, you'd be you'd be pulling, but at the same time it, you'd be, you know, the, all that yanking probably just, uh, it'd have to be, I don't know, it almost had to like you'd be on a drug per se, right? Because yeah. you just have to be on one to basically do that, um, and you know what does I thought this was an interesting scene, yeah, uh, he's walking back, he's staying at this hotel, the detective is. And, you know, what does he have with him? But he has a pig's head and he goes in and he throws it basically in a sink and he tries to pull out the pig's, um, the pig's teeth because he wants to see, you know, how, how much it took. Mm-hmm. And it takes him a while. It's not like it takes no. him uh, like a, an easy second, like, you know, pulling off a, pulling, a, pulling out a nail or something. Yeah. I found that really interesting too. Obviously he's doing some research um, and He's got to look, you know, as a detective, he's got to learn who his victim is. He's got to try to see, and clearly they got to be as strong as him. I mean, it took him a while to do it. And for somebody to, to do a whole lot of teeth, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of patience. Um, So it tells you that this person, like you said, being on a drug would definitely help that because you'd be on a high, keep doing it and not tire out. But Mm -hmm. this it was interesting because the detective clearly is invested in this case. Uh, he's, he's from out of town, but I think it tells you more than anything. He wants to solve this thing very badly and he'll do whatever he has to do to, to get it done. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, through, you know, just hearing from people hearing about the case from, I believe she talks to the detective at a stop sign, you know, a young kid was at near the scene where, uh, Natalie was abducted, uh, or it was Natalie or Anna was abducted. And he said, he said, said he was an eyewitness. He saw a woman in white take her. And this was dismissed by the police. Cause he's a young kid. He comes from a broken family. Uh, his mother is a heroin addict. She's got cancer. He doesn't really have a fault. And this kid has, has his issues. Uh, you know, Camille goes to the home, he's in the window. He's got a freaking Glock in his hand. Um, the mother, like you said, she comes with an IV. She's, you know, strung out to hell. Uh, but it's interesting because this kid says it was a woman who knows if it is or not, but the the cops didn't even take it seriously. They didn't really take his, it's not on the record that his testimony was even taken. 
yeah and she was kind of like what like what the fuck like you know what you have someone who is clearly there at the same time that she was taking why why wouldn't you at least look into this right and he's like well this kid goes you know this kid goes to school this kid goes to school once a week and says oh i was at disney world last weekend or mm-hmm. oh i was here i was that so clearly he's an avid liar i guess and right. to the cop that just means that you know every anything he says is just going to be garbage yeah so she goes you know, the mother says, are you going to pay me to get me to talk? And she says, I, I can't do that, which is true uh, for people. Is that, that's a real, that's a real that's thing. A real thing. You, you can't pay yeah. a journalist. No, uh, or as a journalist, you can't, you can't pay, pay people to do it. Um, it's against ethical code. Um, it's yeah, you, you gotta, they gotta do it cause they want to do it kind of thing. Um, it's like gambling. You got to put your money in, uh, in this case, okay. the person has to, I guess I correlated to going to rehab. You got to, you got to want to go and uh, clearly this woman didn't want to talk to, to Camille. Um, so yeah, the cops discount the, the kid's statement. Um, you know, the mama's cancer, like I said, uh, and then you know, the, the episode, this is another episode where it ends. It's kind of a, it's no cliffhanger. It's yeah. no real uh, dramatic. It's, it's just, she goes to her sister's room. Her door is kind of a jar Um, she's passed out on her bed, uh, clearly drunk. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, and she kind of shuts it and she kind of walks off, but it's a, it's a weird end to the, to the episode. But again, I kind of liked it because I think it's building up to something. These two episodes to start, they're, they're builders. They're uh, very much character development. We don't learn a whole lot about the case. Again, the pliers with the pig was a good right. start. Um, I suspect we'll see another abduction in the next episode or, or so. Mm. But um, I found the few, first two episodes very, very strong. Yeah, it's a in in it's like you said, it's a slow build. You know, yeah. obviously the first I think the first episode more of anything is an introduction. It's an introduction to uh, Camille and her character, the, the parents, and everything after that was you know more about their relationship and why things are the way they are we found out the daughter um sorry mary and the the first i guess not the first daughter but the the first of camille's sisters passed away yeah and i'm sure we'll find out more about that um but we really found out more about the town if anything in the second episode and what kind of town it was where they're showing you know i think his name was james the boy who uh, was with natalie when she was abducted the mm-hmm. golf, whether it's the gossip or stuff like that. And we're just kind of getting this introduction to wind bag or wind gap, sorry, wind gap that. Wind gap, yeah. Yeah. But no, I, as I, I'm saying with you though, awesome start. Uh, love the characters, love Patricia Clarkson's character. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just think that she's doing a great job of being hated. Like I'm yeah. sure, I, I don't know about you, but she's frustrating to watch because you know, she just doesn't, she doesn't have any remorse for, for Camille or no, she's, she's a bad mother. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you, the town, do you think, do you think they're really that sad about these girls dying? I kind of got, you know, I find it a weird, almost the town having to forcefully grieve and not, you know, be like complete panic because I don't think people are that worried about a serial killer. I I didn't get that sense. uh, Yes. And I, yeah, and yeah, you're right. And there's not, and, and that's a great way to put it. Forced grief is kind of how it feels like. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot of worry. The only worry we really see is coming from Adora and that's right. for Emma and that's, and that's about it. Um, you know, it feels like there's not like, and of course the detective can't say what he's, what he has, but it feels like he doesn't have a whole lot on this case yet because no. he really hasn't got a grasp on the town either. Um, and same with the chief of police, who I think is an interesting character. Um, mm-hmm. I guess his name's Bill Vickery. I got it up right now, but he, he's a, he's a funny guy too. Like he's just kind of a, I don't know. He's, he's just always, he's got dirt in his mouth 90% of the time. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, he's, he's not giving anything to Camille either because I, I, he's, his motto is that he's trying to defend the town of Winpeg. He doesn't want this to be what Win, uh, Wincap is known for. And that's, you know, having, having dead children essentially. Right. Yeah. He clearly cares about the perception. Um, and yeah, he, he's an interesting guy. He's an old school cop, uh, Mm, hates the media. Um, you know, he, 
but yeah, I, I just find most people, like you said, there's socialites, there's um, Adora who I don't really think she cares that much about these two girls. She cries about her. I think seeing somebody die being at a funeral when it comes to her daughter's past, right. But she's clearly a self-interested person. And, you know, these two particularly girls dying don't do anything to affect her world in any way, shape or form. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, uh, like I said, great, great start to the show. Um, and, um, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes from here. Uh, but yeah, great start to the recap tonight that we went through everything really thoroughly. I mean, this, this show has a lot, so you gotta, you gotta dig deep and find it because some of it, some of it at the surface, you're like, okay, that doesn't mean anything, but then you figure out 20 minutes later, okay, this was actually telling us something. So I, I like that challenge from the show where you kind of have to, you have to watch the whole thing. You can't be watching the show and, you know, doing the dishes, so to speak, where you could do that. Yeah. I call it, it's, it's non, it's a non, uh, reality, uh, not reality TV, but a non HGTV show where, you know, right. you can walk away for half an hour and the same shit's going on as you, as you just, as, as you just walked away from, yeah. um, no, but I think the director is great. His name, I had it written down here since John Mark Bellet. He's from Quebec, actually, um, and I thought he was strong. Yeah, yeah, he's a and he's a strong actor. He's the same guy who came out with the Dallas Buyers Club. Oh, nice. Movie. I don't know if it's a movie you've seen. Yeah. It's got... Oh, you no, have I've seen it. Okay. Just... It's, it's, it's with McConaughey, but I've seen it. Okay, so yeah, so anyways, he got that, and of course, that's well recognized. But yeah, so he's he's an interesting he's an interesting guy, and I think he's he's doing a good job of telling this story. Um, obviously, it's not written by him, but he's he has. Uh, all the tools and all the, all the talent to tell it through his eyes and how he wants it to be told on screen. No, great point. And uh, I'm glad uh, we see a Canadian uh, director. Uh, that's, that's another great point. A yeah. uh, great oh, part yeah. of this for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll be back next week. Um, and also uh, Shay, you'll be back on the podcast tomorrow night, double duty this week because yeah. you, uh, you, uh, our pal Casey Ward, and then obviously uh, also Sawyer Hannah and myself will be uh, previewing the Canada's 2022 Olympic team. We'll predict the roster. We'll go through uh, our different players. I know we, we're supposed to do it Sunday. We're going to tweak it. I've tweaked my lineup a little bit the last couple of days, Ooh. thinking oh. it over, making a few subtle ads, subtle uh, subtractions, but um, looking forward to that tomorrow night. Should be a lot of fun. You can just be honest, man. It's just uh, you. You heard. You heard mine. It's. Uh, I'll be honest with everybody. I. I kind of. We started on Sunday and we had to stop, um, just with technical errors and also partially my fault. I had something planned. I, uh, you know, knowing knowing Sawyer's schedule and him being late, I should have had more time uh, freed up. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a small dig at him. But no, it's, I'm. It's, I'm excited to do it, obviously, and I love being on the show. So. It's uh, just just a win for me, basically, to come on here again tomorrow night. No, absolutely, should should be a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll have a lot of different opinions, and uh, we got some chaps for sure. Four different, <laughs> four very same, but also very different people. So that so that'll be a fun roundtable. Oh yeah, tomorrow night. But uh, what other than being on tomorrow night? What do you got on the go the rest of the week? Um, I don't get a whole lot. Just just work hard. Uh, my girlfriend Kennedy for it's her birthday on Thursday, so we'll do a little bit of celebrating this weekend, just uh, the two of us probably. Um, but no, nothing, nothing major. I'll be watching this. It's it's hard. I found it hard sometimes doing these series with you because I want sometimes I want to binge watch the everything. You know what I mean? I right. caught I caught a point in next where I wanted to watch three or four episodes ahead, but to have it so to have it more fresh in my mind, I always keep it for the weekend or that Monday night so that when I watch it, okay, well, all those smaller details, well, yeah. I'll have those tuned up. So it, it's tough. Like I'd like to watch it, but um, I got, a, I got a couple other shows on the go and uh, I got a couple of movies lined up that I'd like to see, but no, other than that, what about you? Uh, no, just work uh, and uh, podcasting uh, probably uh, be, on, be on here pretty much every day this week. So lots of content coming out. Um, and then obviously uh, probably watch a couple of sports. Cause I like to do that in my, in my spare time uh, as well. <laughs> no, as you? Well. you really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and also uh, UFC 259 this weekend. So Saturday night, I'll be yes. uh, 
purchasing that three title fights. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, are you, are you doing a review on that or, or I think uh, so. Yeah. I think Sunday morning I'll go through that. Um, and, uh, nice. but three title fights, um, Amanda Nunez, maybe her last UFC fight. Um, I don't know. Maybe she moves up a division. She can only beat so oh, many okay. freaking people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, it's leaving at the top of the game and, the, the most, the, the person I think about leaving at top, maybe, I guess he came back up a couple of times is GSB, mm-hmm. you know, think, think about everything he's done and what he's accomplished. I mean, just, uh, just all around some, some people call him the goat. I don't, I personally don't know enough about the sport to say that, but I think his record certainly holds, holds for itself. No, uh, I wouldn't blame her if she does. Uh, I think she could move up the division when, when there too, but right. She can only beat so many people before Dana White's like, okay, I'm sick of booking you just to kick people's ass. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, but great stuff tonight. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Like I said, Seamus, Casey, Sawyer, and myself will be back tomorrow night. A lot more fun coming and a lot more content coming this week. But uh, stay safe during the storm. Stay warm. And uh, we'll talk soon.